Good morning, and welcome to the Church of the Open Bible. Um, we have several announcements uh, to cover this morning. Um, first, tonight at 6, um, instead of the evening service, we're having Kids Chorus Night, um, which is always a fun time for the kids. And then also afterwards, we have fellowship time for uh, kids' favorite dessert. Um, also later this week, Saturday, is the Cake Bake Off. Um, so hopefully you've got your recipes uh, figured out for that. Also, um, this is the last Sunday for the College Student Care Package donations. Um, so if you have anything um, regarding that, um, if you could see uh, Rick and Marsha Callahan this week, um, actually. And then um, next, well, not next week, but coming up in March, um, there's Kids Night Out. So if you could let uh, Katie know if you have uh, any kids coming to that so she can get a number. Also, um, coming up in March, there's the Ladies Coffee Drop-In. Um, so if you could see uh, Terry Root about that. And I also have another announcement. Um, Arrangements have been finalized for Annette Moore's son-in-law, Robert Yurko, um, who passed away on the 7th. Um, visiting hours are this Wednesday from 4 to 7 p.m. at the Blake Chelmsford Funeral Home in Chelmsford. Um, and his funeral service will be held in the funeral home uh, today at 11 a.m. So if we could please um, continue to keep Annette Moore's and Robert's wife, Sandy, and the whole family in our prayers. Um, let's open the service with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you and praise you for the opportunity to um, just come into your, into your word this morning. I just thank you for the time of Sunday school we've already had and the focus on your word. And I just pray that you'd um, be with us and guide our hearts uh, this morning through song and uh, study in your word that we would be focused on you and just bring honor and glory to you. And I just pray also for Annette Moores and her family that you just uh, be with them in this time and that you would just uh, comfort that family. And I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we want to welcome you this morning. I'm glad to have the opportunity to sing with you, and I hope you sing with me too. Uh, the scripture encourages us in Psalm 33, verse 1 through 9, to shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise benefits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with a lyre. Make melody to him with a harp of ten strings. We have some with six strings this morning. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with a loud shout. That's your part. It's our part. Sing to him a new song with a loud shout. For the Lord, the word of the Lord is, uh, for the word of the Lord is upright, and all his works is done in faithfulness. He loves the righteous and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their hosts. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear him. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. Let's stand together and we'll sing across the lands. As they skillfully play, I hope you will skillfully shout to the Lord. Let's stand together.
as we sing about our Savior this morning, our songs concentrate on the Lord Jesus Christ. So we want to sing about him all hail the power of Jesus' name. before his presence and witness our Savior who is seated right now at the right hand of God. A marvelous, uh, a marvelous day we have to look forward to. We're going to have the men come forward and pray together. As I said, our songs this morning uh, will be focused on I guess we can go ahead and be seated. This is a little different. I'm, I'm doing leading the songs, which is a, which is new to me, and I'm also doing elders' prayer, so it's it's a little different. Um, thank you for your patience. As I said, we're we're singing about the Lord Jesus Christ and focusing on Him this morning, and so I want to pray. Um, with some of the truths that we've seen together. So let's, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we've we come to you this morning wanting to commit our hearts to you and to the, the word of your grace. We want our hearts to be open to your word and Lord, we're full of praise for you. We've just sung about the word you, Jesus Christ, the revelation of God to man, the full expression of God in human flesh, God incarnate. We've sung about you as our creator, the one who spoke every star and planet into existence, the one through whom and in whom we have life and breath. You made all things 
And without your creative word, absolutely nothing was made that exists. Father, we've sung and will sing of you as our sustainer, the one who holds all things together by the power of your voice, who upholds the universe by the word of your power. Father, you are the seeker of men. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost, and we confess this morning that apart from your gracious seeking of us, we would never have sought you. For you tell us that there is none who seeks after God. Father, you are the perfect sacrifice, the only sacrifice that is accepted by God for our sins, the final sacrifice, sacrifice never to be repeated because God's justice has been satisfied. Jesus, you are our Savior. In you we have everlasting life. In you we have eternal life. We have hope. We have deliverance from the judgment and condemnation of our sin. You are our victorious leader. You have conquered death and the grave. And you are seated now with the Father. You are preparing a place for us. And we live in this hope. Jesus, thank you that you are our intercessor. That you stand pleading for us. And oh, oh how we need your pleading. We are as wayward sheep, frequently going astray, frequently disobeying you. And Father, we're thankful for your intercession, that when we sin and we confess our sin, you are ready to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We thank you for these truths about our Savior this morning. Lord, this morning we pray again for Annette and her family. We pray for comfort. We pray for grace. We pray that even this time on Wednesday, visiting hours, and then on Thursday, the burial, uh, Lord, that it would be a time of remembrance, a time to administer grace, that many of us can administer grace to Annette and the family. Lord, we pray that you would use this most of all for your glory and allow Annette, strengthen Annette to be able to clearly put Christ and the gospel on display in her hope of eternity. And Father, use the gospel that the family has seen and heard from her to work in their lives through this difficult time. Father, I thank you for Roger and Vicki Bedsall and for their faithfulness in our midst. And Lord, we ask that you would continue to sustain them, sustain them physically. But more importantly, Father, continue to grow and sustain them spiritually. And that their work in our midst might be effective and continue to impact our church as it has. Pray for Kathy Burroughs, Lord. Uh, pray for her continued growth in you. Pray that you would guide her in your word, in her study of her word, uh, your word, and in her growing in grace and in her uh, deepening relationship with you and her fellowship with us. So, Father, we want to worship you now with our tithes and offerings. Ask that you would bless it and use it in Christ's name. As the offering is collected, we're going to sing, Be Thou My Vision.
I love thee, I know thou art mine. testimony, sing it out as though you mean it. My Jesus, do you know who he is? He's the very Son of God. He's the King of Kings. Have you heard of the gospel? Do you know what it is? It tells us Jesus died for us to save us from our sins. This is the best news that we could ever hear. More than amazing, it drives on every fear. By trusting in Jesus Christ, in his saving
Our scripture reading this morning is from Galatians 5, 16 to 6, 5. I'll read the light type if you could join me in the bold. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have, been crucif have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to be boast will be in himself alone, and not in his neighbor. For each of you bear his own load. Just before John comes to bring the word to us, a song we're going to sing, Speak, O Lord. It says, Take your truths planted deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness. Teach us, Lord, full obedience, holy reverence, true humility. And then we ask the Lord to renew our minds to help us grasp the heights of his plans for us. Truths that are unchanged from the dawn of Trump time. And that is the truth of God's word that we're going to hear this morning. As we prepare our hearts, let's stand and we'll sing this, Speak, O Lord. As we sing, children, you are dismissed for Children's Church.
turn in your Bibles to Matthew 18. We have referenced this text many times in this short series. Uh, Today we're going to walk right through them, uh, through these verses, and hopefully the Lord will bring some things together for us and continue to instruct us on Christ's church made visible. You'll follow along as I read, starting in verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything, they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, There am I among them. Father, we rejoice in your son this morning. And we're asking, Lord Jesus, as our shepherd, that you would abundantly shepherd us through these very words that you spoke for us. We recognize the weightiness. We recognize our weakness. We also recognize that this really is in the area of a church flourishing and caring for one another. And so we just want to be your humble people who grow in this, who understand this from your mindset. We want to have your mind, Lord Jesus, about this area of how we encourage one another and help one another. And we pray that you would bear fruit in each one of us, even this morning, through considering these words together. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. The church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. I don't know who originally said that statement, but it hits on an an important biblical truth. Uh, It is, however, a biblical truth that can be fleshed out in an unbiblical or biblical way. First, the church is actually composed of saints. That is, those who, by God's grace, have been positionally set apart and devoted to Christ through our union with Him. Those who trust in Christ are sanctified in their legal standing, their legal position before God. We are literally holy ones. We are saints. So, though the church is not a museum, it is composed of saints in Christ, isn't it? But it is true that we are saints in Christ, as saints in Christ, we still battle sin, don't we? The church is composed of saved sinners who are saints in Christ. Saved sinners who still need to be set apart from sin and devoted to Christ in our daily lives. The statement that the church is a hospital for sinners helpfully emphasizes this truth. Though we are each holy in Christ positionally, practically we are still being set apart from sin and growing in our devotion to Christ. Sometimes, however, this idea of the church being a hospital is used to question the legitimacy of obeying Christ's instructions in Matthew 18, 15 through 20 with family Church family discipline. The idea is that the last thing we should do is make a big deal about sin because we are all sinners and the church is for sinners anyway. So why would you ever remove someone from church membership over sin? But you don't have to take the illustration of the church being like a hospital in that direction at all. In fact, to do so goes against the whole point of a hospital in the first place, doesn't it? Matthew 9, Jesus says this, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but what? 
but sinners. Jesus is simply saying that he came to save sinners, people who know that they are sinners. That's who he came to save. He came to save people who know that they are spiritually sick. And when someone realizes they are spiritually sick and trusts in Jesus for their forgiveness and cleansing, they are born again, baptized spiritually by Jesus into his one invisible body, the invisible, the universal church. And as we've seen, this one church of Jesus expresses itself in local, visible expressions. And if you want, you can think of these local churches as hospitals for sinners. As we've seen, local churches exercise the keys of the kingdom of heaven by affirming credible confessions of faith in Jesus. And like the, an embassy, the local church stamps passports as much as possible in harmony with reality of the reality of whether or not that person is in fact already a citizen of the kingdom of heaven or not. The church doesn't save anyone. The church simply carries out its representational authority from Christ through baptism, the Lord's Supper, and ongoing family discipline. As we've seen last week, ongoing family discipline is formative training. It's not just what we often focus on, but it's actually formative training. It's, it's, it's corrective. It's all about restoration. And it sometimes ends up being evangelistic. And the effect of it is always evangelistic. All of this going, ongoing discipline flows out of a church culture of discipling one another in obedience to the Great Commission in an ongoing way until we get to eternity. We are all still learning to observe all the commandments of Christ, aren't we? The Lord has designed this family church discipline to be carried out within the context of a local church practicing meaningful membership. 1 Corinthians 12 is clear that the one body of Christ is composed of many different members. And the local expression of the one body is composed of many different people who have, who have been affirmed as members of that local expression of Christ's body. So let's apply this imagery of the church being like a hospital for sinners. The local church is like a hospital that admits patients into the hospital. Keep in mind, the reason why people go to hospitals is not to stay what? Not to stay sick, but to be healed from their sickness. That works. The church is like a hospital that admits people in, in as patients. We affirm that certain people recognize they're spiritually what? Spiritually sick. And that Jesus is their only hope. But the difference between a medical hospital and the local church in this illustration is that the patients that get admitted to a medical hospital want to get better and then they want to get what? They want to get out. But spiritually speaking, until we see Jesus, we will continue to battle spiritual sickness or sin. There's something else that is important to know. In the local church, there are people who lead in the process of healing. But they themselves are also patients. In other words, the church is a hospital for sinners, and everyone in the hospital are patients needing to be healed, and Jesus is their only hope. Well, this imagery is really helpful, and, and I can think of you know, two big picture ways. First, if a church is going to be biblical, we need to each be willing to admit that we need help, right? What happens when a patient will not be honest about their symptoms and how they need help when they go to the hospital? It harms them, doesn't it? It harms those that are trying to help them. Second, if a church is going to be biblical, we need to have a grace-saturated culture and context that invites people to admit they need help. We each need to receive the local church's help in our battle with sin by being willing to get help. And we need to be ready to help in a grace-focused, Christ-centered way when those who need help reach out. I'm sure many of us can remember a time when we were battling a specific sin. It, it had overtaken our lives in some way. 
We were enslaved, but we were too embarrassed to reach out for help. We were so focused on protecting how people viewed us that we were not willing to reach out for help. That is rooted in sinful pride. But that sinful pride can actually be intensified in a certain context. If the culture of a local church is not saturated in Christ-centered, sanctifying grace that enables it to respond in a biblical way with someone who wants help with their sin, then that very context discourages people from reaching out for help. And the last thing sinners who are struggling with sin need is encouragement not to reach out for help. They do that naturally. They naturally don't want to get help apart from a work of the Spirit. So we all need to be willing to reach out for help when we're ensnared in sin, and we need to be the kind of grace-soaked and saturated church that encourages one another to reach out for help, knowing we will get biblical help with that sin. Our relationships within the church need to move past merely being social relationships. Now listen, our relationships should never be less than that. You need to, have, you need to be social. We need to be social. We got to know each other, right? But they need to be more than that. One author describes the problem of a church being made up largely of social relationships rather than Christ-centered relationships like this. Here's a quote. Conversations on Sunday are about work, investments, the sports team, their golf game, and their kids. A crisis of health may be shared, and people may rally around at such a time. This is good. Some do not even share that. Words like these are rarely heard, though. How may I pray for you this week? How have you seen God at work in your life this week? Would you pray for me and hold me accountable in the area of my temper? I've been really harsh with my kids lately. Would you pray with me for a coworker who is not yet a Christian but open to the gospel? You have such a great gift of mercy. I want to encourage you to use it as fully as possible. Indeed, many would consider this type of conversation intrusive. Over the years, there's been several times within the life of a local church when I have asked someone how they're doing in their walk with the Lord. And in a moment of the Spirit working, the person I asked opened up. They weren't intending to. I wasn't suspecting anything. I was just trying to be a brother in Christ, encouraging them, how you doing? And they opened up with a life-dominating sin that they needed desperate help with. Just in fellowship on a normal Sunday. I didn't expect that. I was just trying to encourage them spiritually. They weren't planning to share that. But in a moment of the Spirit working, God did something. And the people I'm thinking about would look back at that question I asked with normal conversation as the turning point in their battle with sin because that was when it first came out in the open and they started getting help. But what if we rarely have that kind of conversation with one another? That's the kind of Christ-centered, grace-saturated, holiness-pursuing culture that needs to flourish among us. Let me just appeal to anyone here this morning. If you're ensnared in a sin and you have been hiding it, you are in desperate need. You know it, but you're terrified to talk to anybody about it. I just want to encourage you that you need to reach out and you need to bring it into the light. It's my prayer that this series will actually encourage us to reach out for help in these situations and many other situations. And my you know, my own personal response to moments like that is honestly to rejoice. When someone is willing to acknowledge they're struggling with sin or doubts and they want help, other than, other than rejoicing when someone comes to know Christ, me personally, as a shepherd, that's a moment, though I don't want to hear the struggle in, in the sense that I, don't, I hate that it's a struggle and I hate that someone's dealing with it, but it's a time to rejoice because God's at work and there is great hope in Christ to transform. 
But going back to the illustration of the hospital, what happens when a patient that has been admitted to the hospital doesn't want to be cured anymore? Another author that's written on this subject of church family discipline imagines such a scenario and suggests that this would be the hospital's response. Quote, you're sick. You're desper- you desperately need to let us help you, and we desperately want to help you, but you're making it impossible for us to do so. We have no choice unless you stop and let us help you, but to ask you to leave. And when you leave the hospital, you're very likely to get even more sick and rethink the importance of what it is we do here. When that happens, we want you to know that we are ready at any moment to take you back in and help you. That is a helpful illustration, isn't it? Because church family discipline really is about dealing with a believer who will no longer admit that they're sick with sin and they don't want help with it. See, a church that's biblically passionate about holiness is a church that's made up of people who do not hide sin out of pride, but seek help for sin out of humility and humbly help each other with it. A church that's biblically passionate about holiness is a church that doesn't brand people who seek help for their sin, but a church that rejoices over God's grace at work in the life of the person who admits it and wants victory over it. It's the kind of context that Christ's, it's in that kind of contract text that Christ's instructions for church family discipline are most fruitfully obeyed. Because what happens when someone in the church no longer wants help with their sin, even though the church wants to help them to be more like Jesus? Well, today what we're going to do is we're going to look at Christ's instructions on how to deal with this. And remember, these instructions come out right after a parable of the father seeking a sheep that's gone astray because he doesn't want them to perish. And then it transitions into these instructions, and the connection is this. God the Father's care for his people is carried out through his people's care for one another. Our primary focus is on the steps of corrective church family discipline that Jesus gives us in verses 15 through 17, but then we're going to briefly, if we have time, finish by considering the authority of corrective church family discipline in verses 18 through 20. So let's consider the steps of corrective church family discipline. Number one, personal confrontation for restoration through repentance. Look at verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. So who are we to personally confront for restoration through repentance? Well, if your brother sins against you. Now, we should... There are applications to how to deal with another believer outside of this local assembly. There are, there are principles that we ought to try to follow in conjunction with their local assembly. But the specific context here is within w- your local assembly dealing with sin. Referring to a brother or sister in Christ in your local church where your confessions of faith have been affirmed through that local church exercising the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What are we to conf- confront in this first step in order to see restoration through repentance? Well, look what it says. If your brother sins against you, and we're not going to spend too much time on this, but there is a textual variant in the Greek manuscripts. And s- the question is whether or not the phrase against you is there or not. But in the end, it doesn't really make a difference because if it's there... The rest of the New Testament says, and it's very clear, that we need to deal with this, we need to deal with sin, whether it's against us specifically or not, in the assembly. We'll see that, especially in the case study next week that we look at. Um, So, either way, these are steps on how to deal with sin within the assembly. And certainly, a sin that's not personally against you is ultimately against the body. Christ and his body and its representation to the world of Christ. So these instructions would apply to sin, whether it's directly against you or sin in general. Now, what kind of sin are we talking about? 
Well, first, it's a sin that should not be overlooked in love. Because sometimes sin should be overlooked in love. Kind of a funny place to start, isn't it? The last thing Christ wants in his church is a kind of suspicious analyzing of one another. A context of stifling sin bounty hunters. That's not what we're talking about. Proverbs 10.12 says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. 1 Peter 4.8, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. There are offenses and there are sins that are not characteristic or that the person is aware of and is battling that need to be covered in love. If we don't know how to do that, we're not going to be able to obey Christ's commands about church family discipline in a biblical way. All you've got to do is be married to know what it means to cover in love, right? All you've got to do is have a close friend to be a parent, all right, and the more we grow as an assembly to knowing one another and knowing each other, the more we're going to have to practice this biblical requirement of covering each other's, covering in love, dealing with things biblically, but dealing with it in love. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist in its own way. It is is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So whatever Christ is saying, he's saying that we should obey these things in that context. That kind of loving context. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. If these are not true about you in that relationship, then you need to deal with that before you can honestly say you're obeying Christ's command here. And on that note, second, it's a sin that we can and must deal with non-hypocritically. In other words, deal with your own sin before and while you seek to help your brother or sister in Christ. This, now, when I say that, that's not an excuse to not deal with it. Because if, we're, if, we, if we say that's an excuse, then what we're saying is I don't need to deal with my sin. We read last week as a, as a congregation, Matthew 7, and the famous passage, Judge not that you be not judged. And this is often used by people to say that you can't do church discipline. But that's just really completely pitting Jesus against himself and misunderstanding the text. He says, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you seek the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Later on he says of false teachers in that very context that you will know them by their fruits, which takes requires a judgment, doesn't it? It makes a discerning decision. So that certainly doesn't take away this point, but it does show us that whatever this sin is that we are to confront one another over, we must, not, we must do so in a non-hypocritical way. This assumes a context of all of us pursuing holiness, doesn't it? Third, it's a sin that someone is caught in and that you must help them with as you walk by the Spirit. A sin that someone is caught in that you must help them with as you walk by the Spirit. We read this morning, Galatians 6.1, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Well, that's helpful, isn't it? Fourth, it's a sin as defined by what? By Scripture. It's not a preference. It's not a personal conscience issue. It's not a personal offense. It's not even a wisdom issue. You may humbly speak to a brother or sister in Christ about what you see as a wisdom issue. But don't approach them over that as a sin issue that requires the steps of Matthew 18. By the way, we need to be humble enough to hear another person reach out to us and say, I think this is a wisdom issue you should consider. We should be willing to hear that. 
fact, that's an important part of the ongoing discipleship in our assembly. We should also be willing to do it and be willing to receive it humbly. We should be willing to hear them say, this is why it's not a wisdom issue in my life. But we cannot elevate our perceived understanding of a wisdom issue to the level of Scripture. You know, the reality is it, 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 that it's, it's true that this sin that we're talking about here is it's something, or you think is a sin, might be something in your imagination about that person against you or others. It's a sin that, and, and so we have to recognize this is not a sin that's in your imagination. It has to be a sin from Scripture. It's a sin that you can turn to a passage in Scripture over that either explicitly or necessar- by necessary and unavoidable implication condemns it as a sin. Fifth, it's a sin that calls that person's confession of faith in Christ into what? It calls it into question. In other words, it's a serious sin of practice or, be- or belief. Now, is, is sin serious, yes or no? All sin is serious. But this sin, with its particular circumstances in this person's life, is of a particularly serious nature because it calls into question the credibility of that confession of faith in Christ, their confession of faith in Christ. Or as one Bible expositor has put it, church discipline is the necessary response to any offense that cannot be safely overlooked without harm to the offender or to the body of Christ. Keep in mind that we should encourage one another and talk about sin that doesn't obviously call our confession of faith into question. Let's say that over time, one brother in Christ observes another brother again and again being harsh and reactive to other people. In humility and out of care for that other brother, it it might be the Lord's will for us to come alongside of them, not because we're trying to start the steps of Matthew 18, but because we just want to help them out and show them, listen, you, you know, I love you, I'm concerned for you, I've been praying for you about this. Have you ever considered, you know, your tone in response to people? We need to be willing to do that and to receive it. But we're not trying to start Matthew 18 on that. Sixth, it's a sin that has some outward expression that could be observed. It's an outward expression of sin. Uh, Next week, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 5, and we're going to see that Paul actually speaks of greed in the context of this area. And very clearly, you can't actually see greed unless it has some external manifestation, right? Like stealing. That's an an observable Thing to deal with. There's one more important point about the kinds of sin that we are to deal with according to Christ's instructions here, and that's whether or not it is a sin that the person is unwilling to repent or turn from. But this first step is really all about uncovering that too. It's, it, it, it's trying to help them see their need to repent. And if they won't, that, this step uncovers that reality. So, How are we to personally confront for restoration through repentance? Well, privately, right? Go to your brother who sins against you, right? Now remember, this is supposed to be happening in a Christ-centered, grace-saturated context of pursuing hard after holiness. And we're to approach one another with a humility and love and concern for one another. And that spirit ought to be abundantly clear when we do so. Now listen, it's, it's very, we all know, it's hard to hear reproof or correction or even someone to raise a question that we might be struggling in an area. We get that, don't we? But the last thing we want to do is give that brother or sister in Christ a reason for rejecting our biblical concern because our spirit is wrong in the way we approach them. It doesn't mean they're going to respond the right way, but we certainly don't want to put any, any hindrances Don't go to anyone else. Go to who? Go to them. Now, there are some rare exceptions to this rule. But in those cases, the only reason you would involve someone else 
is not because you're spreading the word and gossip. It's not because you are backing away from your own responsibility. It's because you cannot carry out Christ's instructions biblically and wisely without involving someone else. But other than those rare exceptions, to go to anyone else who is not part of the solution at this stage is to gossip. And, and it's actually showing that we're not really concerned about that person. We are, when we are supposedly concerned about Christ's reputation and the sin in a brother or sister's life, and yet we don't go to them and instead talk about them to others that are not part of the solution, we are sinning ourselves. If done in the right way, one of the things that can happen is that the brother or sister in Christ points out that we misunderstood something. And that's one of the reasons it's so important to go privately because actually we, we really do have the capability of misunderstanding things, don't we? And if that brother or sister can say, you know what, you're, you, you know, I thank you for coming humbly, but it, this, this is what was going on here. Oh, nobody has to even have a question about it. It's over, right? And we embrace them and we let it go. Or maybe they lovingly and humbly respond with showing from Scripture that we're wrong that such and such a thing that we identified as sin is actually not sin. Can I encourage us to be thankful when someone approaches us, whether like, like this, even if they're misunderstanding something? If they come to us in a right spirit and they're concerned for us, can't you be thankful for that? This is, this is the body of Christ operating. Rejoice over that care that God has given them for you. But let's assume that our spiritual family member that we're talking about here is in sin. Why exactly would we selflessly love another brother or sister in Christ in this way by going and telling him or her about this sin? Why are we to personally confront for restoration through repentance? Well, look at verse 15. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. The word gained there is the word to you've won your brother. The point seems to be that if the brother or sister in Christ repents of that sin, then you've won your sister or your brother back to a credible confession of faith in Christ. That was being called into question, but you've gained your brother through this corrective family discipline. And, and remember that that's the whole goal of corrective family church discipline anyway. Depending on the nature of the sin, part of true repentance will involve that person being willing to get help in working through what led to that sin in the first place. And the, the Lord may have equipped you to help them in that. They've admitted it, they've repented of it, but they need help. Maybe you're equipped to help them with that, or maybe you need to pull someone else in that can help with that. But the, you rejoice. This is being dealt with and is being dealt with. But what if our brother or sister in Christ doesn't respond in repentance? Well, in many cases, this should not be a one conversation thing. You, you may speak to them about it and give them a chance. You probably need to speak to them about it, give them a chance to think it through, give them space for the Spirit of God to work in their life. But eventually, we need to move on to what the second step that Christ gives here. You may actually tell them that you need to involve others in this situation because you need to obey Christ in this area after lovingly, patiently working with them on it. Look at verse 16. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. The background of this step is the Old Testament law that required two or three witnesses to make sure the process was just. This is not saying that you're supposed to find two or three people that saw the sin. That would defeat the whole purpose of a private initial conversation. This is talking about people, look at verse 16, if he does not listen, take one or two along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. The witnesses are there are to confirm what's going on at that stage. Step two, you could put this way involving others as witnesses to confirm the issue and if confirmed to witness the process of seeking restoration through repentance. One of the reality of sin is that it's deceptive and apart from a work of the Spirit in our lives when 
confronted about our sin, we tend to shrink, shrink, shrink back and hide it. But one of the wisdom aspects of what Christ is, is giving here is that this gives an opportunity for the person to see, oh, others know now, and it can unmask the deceitfulness of sin. Who should these one or two other people be that make up the two or three witnesses at this stage? Well, I found Wyman Richardson's principles helpful for determining who should be a witness at this stage. He has a book called Walking Together on this whole topic of church family discipline. Listen to the principles he gives. It's someone who is influent, has influence in the person's life, though not somebody who would be personally injured by knowing the situation. It should be someone with a strong Christian character. It should be someone who agrees with the biblical teachings on church discipline and who will uphold the biblical process. It should be someone who is in good standing with the person you're going to, going to so that the person you're going to will not be distracted by their presence or feel that they have a personal motive in coming. It should possibly be someone who will have a continuing role in the process of, deci- uh, of discipline should it proceed to the next steps, next step or steps. In other words, it, it may need to be one of the elder overseer pastors in the assembly at this stage. It should be a person who is open enough with you to tell you that you are understanding, you're misunderstanding the situation if that happens to be the case. If you're the one that says, I need you to help me to talk to this person, they need to be someone willing to say, listen, if it's me, John, you're, you know, you're, you're wrong. You're not understanding the situation at all. They should be objective. It should be a person of prayer. It should be a person who can honor confidence. It should be a gentle person. It should be a bold person. Once you decide who to ask to be a witness, you can approach them and say that there is a brother or a sister in Christ that you believe is caught in a sin and that needs to be restored to a credible confession of faith in Christ through repentance. And you can communicate to them that, that you believe they are someone the Lord could use as a witness to confirm or work through this, that reality. Without saying who it is, Ask them if they would be willing to be part of this confidential process. And I want to point out that we should never give anyone a blank check about, never, about something they're about to tell us that we don't know about. Someone says, now I'm going to tell you something, but you've got to promise not to tell anybody. You got, what do you say? I will promise not to tell anybody if it's not a legal issue or a biblical issue where I have to. That's what you say. But there may be, so there, there may be situations that we would be sinning to not tell others about. So we should be very careful about that. We will not break confidence about something unless we are legally or biblically required to involve others. If you're approached like this before you commit and hear who it is that's potentially sinning, I'd encourage you to inquire if the person has dealt with it biblically to this point. Don't tell me who it is. I just want to ask What's your process been to this point? Once you have the one or two other people that make up the two or three witnesses, then you're to carry out what verse 16 says. Look again at verse 16. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. What are you doing in this step? Well, step two is involving others as witnesses to confirm the issue And if confirmed, to witness the process of seeking restoration through repentance. It is possible that at this stage, the other witnesses or witnesses simply don't see the situation like you do. And if that's the case, what do you do? You trust Christ's wisdom and you say, it's over. If it's been done biblically, you just trust that to the Lord and you, you don't repeat the matter, you don't hold it against the person, you move on trusting in the wisdom of your Savior. The witnesses are designed by God to prove, provide justice and protection for the accused. But also they are designed to witness whether or not the sinning brother or sister is willing to repent. And once again, this step is probably not going to be over one conversation. This needs to be a patient, careful thing. This is not step one's at 8 a.m. on Saturday morning, step two's 12 p.m. on Saturday afternoon. It's not what it is. Once you understand the whole point of this, 
It means that you realize it's got to be about patiently giving space to pursue this person and for the Spirit of God to work. So step one, <clears throat> personal confrontation for restoration through repentance. Step two, involving others as witnesses to confirm the issue and if confirmed, to witness the process of seeking restoration through repentance. But what happens if a brother or sister in Christ will not repent of the sin even after this patient and loving effort to restore them to a credible confession of faith? Look at verse 17. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. It's at this point that the elders would necessarily be brought into the process because they're going to be leading in the process to tell the church. So if they're not already involved in set step two, at this point they're getting involved. Now, why would we tell the whole church? Well, look at what the rest of the verse says. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, so the church is what? Saying something, right? If he refuses even to listen to the church, let him be to you a, a Gentile and a tax collector. That is the fourth step, but notice what it assumes about the third step. It assumes that the whole church is saying something to them. They're saying something to this sinning church family member. They're trying to do their very same thing that you were trying to do when you first talked to the person. You're trying to win back your brother or sister in Christ. They're doing the same thing that two or three witnesses were trying to do. They're trying to win back their brother and sister or Christ to a credible confession of faith in Christ. The whole church is doing this now. The whole church is seeking to win or gain their brother or sister in Christ back to a credible confession of faith in Christ for their good, for the good of the church, for the glory of Christ in the world. So step three is inform the church so the whole church can seek to restore the sinning family member to a credible confession of faith through repentance. Now, I want to remind us that this whole process has to do with restoring someone to a credible confession of faith in the context of a local church that's already exercised the keys of the kingdom, affirming credible confession of faith. Which means that we're seeking to restore someone who is a member of the assembly. They are a member of this visible expression of Christ's church. We've already affirmed their credible confession of faith through the public testimony of baptism if they were a new believer when they joined us. Through the ongoing participation in the Lord's Supper and now we're seeking to restore them to that credible confession of faith through corrective family discipline. Christ has given us this representational authority to no longer affirm someone's confession of faith with the very people that have already exercised that authority with by becoming, welcoming them into that local church and membership. Our authority that we need to exercise in this way is with church members who continue to confess faith in Christ, but who are calling that confession of faith into question by not repenting of sin. So in a members meeting, as elders, we would equip our assembly on how to pursue this person in love, to restore them to a credible confession of faith in Christ through repentance. We would also communicate as an assembly to this person that until they're willing to repent, they should not observe or take from the Lord's table. It's during this fourth step that I believe Paul's instructions in 2 Thessalonians 3 come into play in the context of dealing with a brother in Christ who was unwilling to earn their own living, Paul says this, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. Later in the same passage, he says this, verse 13, And for you, brothers, as for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. So at this stage, in this situation, Paul's counseling a change in relationship with that professing brother, but not to regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Still treat him as a brother in Christ. 
So the whole church is praying, and especially those who have a relationship with his professing brother or sister are pursuing them, warning them, begging them, loving them toward repentance. That change of relationship is not a Christless shunning. It's not the severing of any kind of relationship. It's the change of the relationship from casualness to a specific intentional focus on restoring that person to repentance. I do want to point out that Scripture acknowledges there are different spheres of responsibility within our human existence. One of them is family. And so no doubt while this practice, would, and, and if someone in our family is going through this, and they're not willing to repent of sin, no doubt our relationship is going to be affected, but we have specific res- responsibilities with that family member that we need to continue and there's going to be a level of normalcy and casualness because it's we have a responsibility in that sphere but there but specifically here the point is this while certainly even immediate family relationships and extended family relationships are affected there are different responsibilities okay But as an assembly, the point is, for a time period determined by the elders, the whole body appeals to this person who continues to name the name of Christ, but who will not repent of sin. And the change of relationship would be that now, we're we're not just casually relating, we're actually relating to them specifically to deal and help with them on this issue. We're really helping them focus. This is what needs to be dealt with. And you're doing it in love and care. After this time is over and the person has still not responded, then what? Verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. In other words, Jesus is saying, relate to this person as a what? An unbeliever. What would that involve? Well, it will continue to involve a changed relationship, but now you don't treat them as a brother, you treat them as an unbeliever who continues to profess faith in Christ, but who does not have a credible confession of faith in Christ. It will also involve clearly identifying that person as an unbeliever by removing him or her from the membership because the church can no longer affirm the credibleness of their confession of faith in Christ. That will also require, of course, refusing participation in the Lord's Supper and by implication any other function of the church that would communicate that they have a credible confession of faith in Christ. Generally speaking, it would involve encouraging them to come and hear the word of God in church. But being careful not to communicate that they are part of the assembly. Actually now, they don't have a credible confession of faith. You could summarize step four like this, removing any affirmation of their confession of faith in Christ. Now the whole body is focused on evangelizing this person, but doing so as a person who once was a member of the church and who still confesses faith in Christ, but who's living in contradiction to that confession. Now we've spent more time on the early steps because the case study we're going to consider next week is going to focus in on the last steps again. But I do want to just summarize this and and we'll be done very soon. What happens when the whole church continues to pursue this person and the person wakes up and repents? Well, think of step five as the father and the parable of the prodigal son. Remember, church family discipline is all about God the Father's care for each one of us. And in the parable of the prodigal son, the father represents our heavenly father standing, looking down the road with his arms wide out, looking for this boy, right? Right? Step five is us as a church being like our Heavenly Father, standing, looking down the road, waiting to welcome back and rejoice over the person returning home in repentance. So step five is the whole church is poised and ready to forgive and welcome back upon repentance. So Jesus has given us the framework of patiently loving a patient, a patient, loving way to carry out corrective family church discipline for the purpose of restoring someone to a credible confession of faith in Christ. Step one, 
personal con- confrontation for restoration through repentance. Step two, involving others as witnesses to confirm the issue and if confirmed, to witness the process of seeking restoration through repentance. Step three, inform the church so the whole church can seek to restore the sinning family member to a credible confession of faith through repentance. Step four, removing any affirmation of their confession of faith in Christ. Step five, the whole church is poised and ready to forgive and welcome back upon repentance. Now, what authority do we have in all this? And very quickly, look at verse 18. The authority is this. Corrective church family discipline is carrying out God the Father's will on earth. Look at verse 18. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Well, we've spent a lot of time on that already. That's referring to the function of the keys of the kingdom, carrying out the representational authority that Christ has given us to affirm or not affirm the credibleness of someone's faith. But verse 19 expands a little bit, and and it's an explanation here. And verse 19 is not talking about a prayer meeting. Okay, probably the reason why the most popular interpretation, the popular level interpretation of verses 19 and 20 is a prayer meeting is because of how rare it is for a church to obey Christ on church family discipline. You've got to do some of these verses. All right, well, look what they are. This is obviously not about a prayer meeting. Again, I say to you, if two of you, referring to the smallest portion of the church that's seeking to affirm the credibleness of a sinner's believing a sinning believer's confession of faith. If two of you agree on earth about anything, they ask. So in the whole process of church family discipline, if two of you agree on, any, on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. In other words, when the church is in harmony with heaven through a biblical approach to church family discipline, then we are told that God is at work in that situation. That's an incredible promise, isn't it? It's the kind of promise you need as an assembly, to be able to walk through something like this. And to heighten the significance of the church obeying Christ in this, look at what verse 20 says. Again, what we're about to read here has nothing to do with defining a church or the presence of Jesus at a prayer meeting. It's not what it's about. Look what it says. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. In other words, corrective family church discipline is carried out with the promised presence of who? Of Jesus. I hope that you have seen, you can see biblically through this series about Christ's church being made visible that, that you can't play church. I can't play church. This is Christ's church made visible in many different places in the world. He's the head. He's instructed on us in our passionate pursuit of grace-motivated, Christ-centered holiness and love for one another, caring for each other, communicating the Father's love for one another. He has told us how to operate in this realm. The church is the body of Christ. And the one body of Christ is expressed in visible local churches. And Jesus takes his church's purity and focus on him very seriously. Can you see how Christ's instructions in this passage make no sense whatsoever if our view of the local church and submission to Christ in that local church through church membership is kind of like a take it or leave it thing? These instructions assume a clear following of Christ together with his people. So may the Lord grow us in our love for the church in this way. Because we're growing in our love for her Lord. And next week, Lord willing, we'll look at a case study of this. And the week after, we'll consider the wonderful joy of forgiveness and rejoice in Christ together. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for your son's wisdom. And we commit ourselves to you as your people. Again, we acknowledge our weakness. But we as your people want to follow you. We want to obey your son. And we want to see uh, your care for us flourishing in this assembly through one another. And so we pray that you would shepherd us 
and that your spirit would produce these very things that are so necessary for us to flourish according to your design. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. As we reflect on God's word this morning and these truths, and the sing, O Great God. And the hymn writer, as we pray together this song, he says, Occupy my lowly heart, own it all, and reign supreme. This is our desire. I trust that's the prayer of your heart as you've heard the truth of God's word this morning. Let's stand and we'll sing that together. Mm-hmm.